Dark Elf roster is extremely aggressive, with high damage coming right out the gate from turn 1. This aggression does sometimes leave them open to enemy attack however, as the strong focus on attack sometimes means that they forget to defend. They have a large roster of monstrous units, as well as monstrous carbot giving them a lot of mass and power right from the mid game. Sadly, this leads to a lot of micro intensive battles, as they must be constantly wrangled to make sure they're doing their jobs without being taken to pieces. They also have a pretty good selection of lords, with many laws of magic and mounts available, making each choice very versatile. But one area where they lack is their range, with a small but powerful selection, but not actually a lot of range amongst them, making using them a lot riskier. Before we get into the roster, they also have a battle ability. The Dark Elves have the Murderous Prowess Army ability, and nearly every single unit in the roster has this passive. Upon a certain number of entities being killed on any side in combat, Murderous Prowess triggers to grant all units in your army with the ability access to the buffs, vastly increasing their power for 90 seconds. Okay, onto the roster, starting with the Lords, and starting with Malekith the Witch King. He's a great all-around battler, being both powerful in melee and a spellcaster. The lore of dark magic isn't the best in the game, but it's better than nothing for a bit of added power. Now, his melee power isn't the most armor piercing, so against tougher enemies he's not going to hit quite as hard, so try to stick to low armor targets to get the most value. He's also pretty tanky with high armor and defense, as well as the silver shield, so can act as a great lord leading from the front. Getting stuck in versus low armor targets and keeping out from getting too deep versus high damage, as he can still go down if surrounded. As long as he stays near his own troops, he should be just fine. He also has three mounts. The cold one gains some HP, armor, speed and charge bonus whilst becoming a little bit larger. He also now has more armor piercing damage so can tear through tough enemies a lot easier. He still has those great melee stats so can still go into sustained combats, but with a large hitbox he'll likely go down a little bit faster even with the improved HP. Instead you can now use them for charging around to make the most of the speed and charge bonus, either back lines followed by sustained combat, or backs of the front lines for hammer and anvil. Whatever you do, keep him with some allied units to keep him safe, and don't let him get targeted by enemy range, as a large hitbox makes for a much easier target. The Cold One Chariot drops a lot of his melee stats, some speed and tall weapon strength to gain more HP, charge bonus and bonus versus infantry. This means he wants to be used exclusively to charge around and make the most of that bonus, and avoid taking damage especially with the large hitbox, lack of shield and reduced melee stats. Keep him on the move in and out of whichever enemy units you fancy, and do not let let him get pinned down in melee or focus fire from range as he will go down fast. And finally Seraphon, this is unique black dragon, he gains a ton of HP, speed, melee stats and weapon strength whilst losing a little bit of armor and charge bonus. Of course he's now flying on the dragon with the noxious breath ability so can fly around the battlefield taking on whatever you set your sights on. Backlines, artillery, front lines, whatever you want you can attack it and will likely do a pretty good job taking it out. Just watch out for being surrounded or focus fired as the hitbox is massive so easily wiped out if caught. Next up we have Marathi. Despite her armor piercing and anti-large bonus damage, I would say Marathi is still a pretty basic spellcaster and it's really pretty obvious why. She has no armor, so going into melee with only 40 defense, she's going to take a ton of damage from basically anything. Again, something with basically no attack, she might be okay, but I'd only advise this if you absolutely need to. Instead, keep her safe at the back of your lines, using her mix of spells to assist your army and rain terror onto enemies. She has some decent picks from her mix of laws, so whatever you want, damage or debuffs, you're all set. She also has one mount, Sulfit. This grants her HP, armor, speed and charge bonus. It's not a ton of armor, but it's enough if you want her to go around attacking enemy ranged units. Still, I just use extra speed to get her in position to cast wherever needed, rather than becoming more involved in combat. Of course, the hitbox is a little bigger to keep an out for enemy ranged to keep her safe. Next up, we have Crone Helbron. Crone has the same armor as Marathi and great damage, but thankfully she also has some resistance to keep her a little bit safer in combat. Now, a lot of units these days have magical damage, so you'll have to keep an eye out for those to make sure they don't target her, as she can still be easily taken out by even moderate damage once it gets through her defenses. The bonus versus infantry, of course, means frontlines combat is where she belongs, being supported by your own units to keep her safe. As long as you throw her in and keep an eye out for high damage, especially magical, you should have a ton of success. She also has three mounts. The Dark Steed grants her a little bit of HP as well as speed and charge bonus. Of course, you can use extra speed to charge her around the map, cycling in and out of enemies for added bonus damage. Or you can just use it to keep her safe and use it to flank enemies to get into vulnerable back lines that won't be able to fight back against her. She also has the Manticore, which drops some speed and melee stats to gain more HP, armor, and of course, flight. Use this new mobility to get around enemies into their more vulnerable back lines. The reduced melee stats mean you don't want to send her into the middle of front lines since she just won't be able to survive. Stick to the backs and other units that can't defend themselves and keep her supported to ensure she doesn't get focused down. Finally, the Cauldron of Blood. This gains HP and armor and loses everything but leadership. She also gains two abilities, which can massively buff nearby units. This one kind of sacrifices a lot of her own efficacy to improve the units around her, making her into more of a front lines buff machine than anything to be used for heavy combat. She can still get into the front lines a little bit with armor and armor piercing damage, but keep her against low damage enemies to ensure she doesn't take too much of her low defense. Also keep her outside of enemy ranged, and she should do great. Loki of Felhat is next, and Loki is an extremely consistent front lines battler and excellent duelist. He has very high armor, great melee stats, and decent 
damage with a bonus versus infantry, though not the most armor piercing. Sending him against lower armor foes for easy value, either on the front lines or one on one against lords and heroes. Nothing more to him than that, really, since he has no spells. Just throw him in and watch him work. As long as he doesn't get totally surrounded by armor piercing, he should be just fine. He also has one mount, Maelstrom. This is his unique black dragon, so it comes with noxious breath, some added value. Aside from that, just gains a ton of HP, speed and armor piercing, whilst losing quite a lot of defense. He's still a great fighter and can now go anywhere on the map, so send him around to fight whatever you fancy, be it front lines or back. Just avoid being focused fired from a range or surrounded in melee, as the larger hitbox makes him into an easy target. Next we have Malice Darkblade. Malice is THE one-man armor in the game, and it's not really that hard to see why. He has great armor, very high leadership, melee stats, and a huge armor piercing damage, and this is before you get any levels into him. Send him into the front lines to fight basically anything, and he'll likely come out on top. Add on to this his two abilities and transformation, and he's basically unstoppable. When he transforms into Sarkhan, to start off with, his HP and Vigor are totally restored. He gains a massive boost to his attack, as well as more weapon strength and charge bonus. He also gains a couple of extremely powerful abilities, and is unbreakable. Yes, his HP does drain over time, but it's not really fast enough to matter when he can kill this quickly. Just make sure you use it when Mars is getting towards the end of his life to get the maximum value. He also has one mount, Spite. This gains improvements to every stat but melee and leadership. It just makes him better without any real downsides aside from the slightly larger hitbox. He can still throw down in melee with the best of them as well as dash around the map into the back lines with his new and improved speed. I'd still say sustained combat is his best use even with the charge bonus since he really is just a powerful front lines presence. Just don't let him get surrounded or focus fired and he should be just fine. And yes, you can use Sarkhan on this mount. And our final legendary lord is Rakarf. Yet another great battler with high armor, great melee stats and pretty nice damage of a bonus versus large. Add on his baseline abilities and you have a Lord that can do some great work on the front lines and squeeze every drop of performance out of his own troops too. Game fighting versus basically anything and he'll do a great job. Not as great as Malice, but still great. Nothing else to say that hasn't already been said, just make him fight. He also has three mounts. The Scourge Runner Chariot gains HP and speed whilst dropping its melee stats and armor piercing damage to gain missiles and of course the Chariot. He doesn't have the best charge bonus, so cycle charging won't get tons of damage, but it still is the way to go with the massive drop in melee stats. Leave him on fire at will whilst doing this to keep the ranged armor piercing damage pumping the entire time and get twice the value out of just a single unit. Either that, just use the speed to get him into a good position and then fire at key tags with the armor piercing damage and long range. He also has a Manticore and Brachus, which is his unique Black Dragon. Gains a ton of HP, some speed, and a lot of weapon strength over the Manticore, all at the cost of a little bit of charge bonus. It's another Black Dragon, so you already know what to do. Use the Breath ability for even more damage. Aside from that, attack whatever you want, as long as you don't get surrounded or focus fired. Now come to our generic Lords. First up, the Dreadlord with the Sword and Crossbow. Melee stats-wise, actually most of them are Malkith, being a little bit worse in most stats. Alongside this, they also have their armor-piercing range damage, so it can soften key targets up before heading in for some melee. I'd keep them at range for as long as possible, since the damage really is a lot better. Try to run out of ammo before getting them stuck in, and focus their fire on the highest threat on the battlefield. Preferably a single target, since the high damage will be wasted against single infantry entities. He also has a choice of four mounts. The Dark Steed, the Cold One, Dark Pegasus. This drops some armor to gain HP, speed and charge bonus of the Cold One, as well as of course being able to fly. This makes them much faster around the map, as well as decent charges with the bonus. If you use the high speed and flight to get good firing angles onto key targets, or leave on fire at will and charge them around for a little more hands-on damage. Just keep them spawned with other units if you do this, as they still aren't the best fighters and can go down easily if they get pinned. And finally, a Black Dragon. It's not unique, but it still has the same functionality as the other Black Dragons we've seen from the Legendary Lords, so you use it the same for the same great results. Dread Lords also come with the Sword and Shield. These gain some slight improvements to their melee stats and charge bonus, as well as of course their shields over crossbows, but aside from that, they are more or less the same. Just obviously use this one in melee, since they have no ranged, and of course they have the same four choice of mounts. The Dark Steed, the Cold One, the Dark Pegasus, or the Black Dragon. Next up we have the High Beastmaster. Strangely, these are more similar to Loki rather than Rakaf, but of course are worse in almost every stat. Still, you can use them pretty much the same, but be a lot more cautious when you fight with their much reduced armor. If they can't attack anything large to proc their bonus damage, even more power to them. They also come with two mounts, the Scourger and a Chariot, and the Manticore. And our final generic lords are the Supreme Sorceresses. They come with Lore of Beasts, Lore of Dark Magic, Death, Fire, or Shadows. These are of course most similar to Marathi, with reductions to basically every stat but HP. Of course, they're basic spellcasters, so stick them at the back of your army and rain support where needed. You have quite a selection of laws, but the best have sure fire or shadows, so take your pick and rain destruction. They also come with five mounts. The Dark Steed, the Cold One, the Dark Pegasus, the Manticore, or the Black Dragon. Now we come to the heroes, first up we have the Master. Of course, they're just smaller, kind of weaker versions of the High Beast Masters, so use them pretty much the same and they'll do just fine. That being said, they have a lot of armor piercing damage, so can do well versus some pretty tough enemies, especially if they can use their anti-large bonus. They also have a lot more armor, so can do well versus low armor piercing foes, but aside from that, you can use them pretty much the same on the front lines. They also come with four mounts, the Dark Steed, the Cold One, the Cold One Chariot, and the Dark Pegasus. 
Next up, Death Hags. These are of course much weaker versions of Crow and Hellbron with cross the board, stat reductions as well as much less armor piercing damage. Still, use them pretty much the same, only now target less armored foes to get the most out of their damage, and their one mount is the Cauldron of Blood. Next we have the Canine Assassins. These are most close stat wise to Malice, but of course don't really come close to his insane power level. As Assassins, they're of course best suited to taking out single targets one on one, and with their lack of armor piercing damage, this means things like less armored heroes and casters are great choices. They also have their range damage, which is actually better than their melee, so you can soften the targets from afar before moving in to finish them off. Just know it does have quite a short range, so they have to put themselves in a little bit of danger to get off shots. Try to keep them out of the actual front lines, especially against anything with actual damage, as their defense isn't the greatest, especially when being attacked on all sides. And our final heroes are the Sorceresses. They come with a lore of beasts, dark magic, fire, death, or shadows. Literally, just slightly weaker Supreme Sorceresses. Scissors. Use them the exact same at the back, casting spells, and they'll do fine. And they come with three mounts. Dark Steed, the Cold One, and the Dark Pegasus. Now we come to the melee infantry. First up we have Dread Spears. These are your early game line holders with respectable armor and defense, making them pretty tanky at this stage of the game, especially when they're up against lower damage most of the time. Even versus range, they have a silver shield, so can take a beating from pretty much anything at their stage of the game. Of course, of all this defense, they don't have the greatest damage, so we'll need help from other units to take out whatever's in front of them. Their damage isn't terrible per se, but if you want to take enemies out quickly, they will for sure need an assist from whatever you have at this stage. Next we have Bleak Swords. Bleak Swords swap things around from Dread Spears in that they have less armor and defense, but more attack and weapon damage, making them a little more damaging against not armored foes. They aren't proper damage dealers or anything, but early on, they'll do all right versus most forms of enemy chaff. Still, support them with whatever you can to keep them healthy and winning whatever combat they find themselves in. Personally, if you have other damage to bring, then I'd stick with Spears, but if you have no other choice, then Swords are just fine some added punch. Next up, Black Art Corsairs. These are a major step up in terms of toughness from the swords with over double the armor or while being quite a bit faster. Now they don't have shields and their defense isn't great, but they do get quite a nice bonus versus infantry, so they'll be throwing out just as much damage as they take in. They make for a great front line if you want something a little more aggressive early on, as long as they're not going against armor piercing, they'll be relatively tanky. Use them the same as the other two to hold the line and have other units come in for some added damage to keep them healthy and wipe out foes as fast as possible. Next we have Witch Elves. Obviously these ladies don't have the greatest defense in the world with very low armor, not great defense, and only 20% physical resistance. Against anything with some real damage coming back at them, they're going to take some serious hits if they're the main targets. And so the best way to use these is flanking infantry. I was going to use their high speed to get around enemy lines and sandwich front lines to take them out as quickly as possible. With their Madness of Cain infused attacks, they'll slaughter whatever you put them up against. Just make sure that they can get away from said slaughter. Just don't let them be the focus of any form of damage, especially magical, or they will go down faster than Marathi at a family reunion. Next we have these Sisters of Slaughter. These share the lack of defense in terms of armor and resistance, but they do have one thing keeping them safe. They have a massive melee defense stat for an infantry unit, so it can be deceptively tanky, especially against units that don't have a particular high attack. As for their own attack, it's not too bad either, but the damage leaves a lot to be desired, especially for a tier 3 unit. It's fairly low, not armor piercing, and even with the poison, it's a bit of a hard sell. Of course, you'll want to bring in units to do more damage to make them more viable on the front lines, so throw as much support as you can at them, and watch out for any missiles, since they'll still hurt a lot, even with the bronze shield. Next, we have the Hargeneff Executioners. These are the damage dealing front line of the Dark Elf late game. They have the same attack as sisters, but now come with a ton of armor piercing damage with a bonus versus infantry, making them a perfect damage dealer for the front lines. Their defense isn't quite as high, but isn't too low either, and they have a very high armor to make up for this. The only real downside is the lack of shields, making them an easy target of enemy ranged, looking to get some high value kills. Use them to slaughter the front lines using other units to take out enemy range to keep them safe, or to reinforce the front lines for even more damage. You can never take out enemies fast enough, so if adding something to fight with these guys helps move things along quicker, then why not? And finally, we have the Black Guard of Nagarond. To me, these are the ultimate endgame front line of the Dark Elves, and it's not that hard to see why. They have massive damage, nearly unbreakable leadership, decent attack, high defense, and charge defense with a bonus versus large. They are built to stand and face the enemy head on, no matter what the enemy is throwing at them. They're super tanky and can last a very long time versus anything but the highest armor piercing damage dealers. On top of this, they also do pretty great damage themselves with armor piercing and anti-large bonus, so they really can do it all. Of course, give them any help you can afford to make them take out enemies even faster, and you'll be cruising your way to victory in no time. Now we come to the ranged infantry. First up, Dark Shards. These are your early game ranged infantry, and for the early game, they sure do have a decent chunk of armor piercing damage. Now, to keep things balanced, they don't have the greatest range, but with their curved firing out, they can fire over units' heads just fine, so sit at the back of your army and rain onto enemy infantry at their own leisure. Of course, getting them an angle will mean more damage output and less friendly fire, but only do that if it's safe, since they cannot defend themselves against anything even remotely combat-ready. They also come to another variation, Shielded Dark Shards. 
Again, shields and some melee defense making them slightly tougher versus most forms of damage. If you have the cash to spare and want to keep them even more safe, then go right ahead. Still, avoid melee combat as much as possible to keep them alive. They should only be using this extra defense if they absolutely have no other choice. Next up, we have the Black Art Corsairs. These are a bit more of a lateral move since they lose even more range, some ammo, and a lot of armor pacing in exchange for massively improved melee stats and firing whilst moving. They are basically the melee Black Art Corsairs with some range and slightly worse attack, so realistically they're more of an alternate for them than a proper ranged unit. Still you can use them together for a real Corsair army using the melee ones for the front lines before sending these lads around to fight into the backs of the front lines or sandwich them in melee. You don't have to worry too badly about them getting into combat since they'll be just as tough, still keep them firing or fighting what you want rather than letting the enemy decide for you. And finally we come to Shades. These are fairly comparable to Bleak Swords in terms of their melee, being a little better in most areas. Their ranged damage is basically just an improvement on the Dark Shards with more range and damage, so what's not to love? You can use them as purely backlines units firing over your troops' heads or get them into the flanks for an easier shot. Whatever you do, just keep them firing since their damage output is so much higher even if they are passable in melee. Especially later in the game, they tend to go down pretty fast with their low armor and defense, so keep them safe wherever possible. They also have a couple of variations. The dual weapon shades gain some more defense and weapon strength, so are marginally stronger alongside the bonus versus infantry. Still keep them out of melee, especially against anything with armor since they will just not punch through and likely take a lot of damage for their troubles. And the great sword shades that lose that defense but gain a ton of armor piercing melee. This means they'll be dealing a load of damage to whatever they come into contact with, but again, avoid this if you can since the ranged is just as much, if not more damage, all whilst keeping them completely healthy. Once they run out of ammo, by all means, send them in to support your lines, but while they have shots to fire, keep them firing. Now we come to the cavalry. First up, Dark Riders. These are your average early game cav units with high speed and decent charge, but not the best melee stats. Use their high speed to flank enemies and cycle charges back to the front lines or catch out backlines ranged units. Against very weak range, they can stay in fight, but for maximum damage and safety, cycle charging is the way to go in pretty much every other situation. They also come in another variation, Shielded Dark Riders. These gain shields for some extra defense, using the exact same, just now they're a little tougher from most forms of damage. Cold One Knights are next, and these lose some speed to gain improvements to every other stat, making them more devastating in the same role. The melee stats still aren't great, so cycling is the way to go. They have a lot more armor piercing damage, so can charge in some pretty tough enemies and still get a ton of value. Whatever you do, keep them on the move so they can't get pinned down in melee or picked apart by ranged. Next up, Doomfire Warlocks. These are a very utility based unit with stats not too much better than the Dark Riders in terms of their damage, with the addition of poison and magic but losing half of their armor. Their true value is in their high resistance and bounce spells, allowing them to shrug off non-magical damage and get a lot of value even when they aren't in direct combat. When they do get into combat, stick with cycling again as the melee stats aren't great so they will still take a lot of damage whilst not fighting. Against weaker backlines, it's fine, but against anything else, you're going to want to hear them run. And finally, the Cold One Dread Knights. These are just as fast as the regular Cold Ones but have improvements to basically everything but charge bonus, which gets a little bit worse. These are actually pretty great in sustained combat with the high armor and decent melee stats. I won't go replacing your front lines since they still have a large hitbox, but if you charge them into the backs of the enemy lines, you can leave them in without having to worry too much. As long as they aren't against some super high armor piercing damage or focus from a ranged, they should do great no matter where you send them. Now we come to the Missile Cavalry. First up, the Repeater Crossbow Dark Riders. These lose some of the melee stats of the base unit, but gain ranged damage that is a little bit worse than the Dark shards, but still pretty strong with high armor piercing for their stage of the game. With the curved firing arc, they should never struggle to get shot, but cannot fire whilst on the move, so you want to set them up and get them firing whilst avoiding melee like the plague. If they get caught out by basically anything, they'll lose, so keep it out for flankers and you should do great. Scourge Runner Chariots can fire whilst on the move, and since they're a chariot with decent charge bonus, this means they can be put on fire at will and charged in and out of enemy lines to rack up a ton of damage, both from the melee and from the ranged firing whilst they roam around. Keep them on the move at all times to ensure they can't be focused down as a large hitbox and low defense will spell a quick doom, as will any ranged focus. The missile damage is high armor piercing and has the bonus versus large, so with the low missile count, try to focus their shots onto large targets like single entities to get the most value. And finally, the Cold One Chariots. These lose a little bit of speed and some range, but gain improvements to all their damage as well as more armor. You can still use them basically the same, so charging around with fire at will on to get added value whilst on the move. Do not leave them in melee as they will die. Do not leave them to get shot at as they will die. And this time, let them fire at whatever they want as it's just pure armor piercing, so they'll get a ton of value no matter what it is. As long as it's a valuable target, they'll be hitting it pretty hard. Next up, the monsters and beasts, and first we have harpies. Harpies are a great blitzing unit that can wipe out enemy backlines pretty quickly when used right. The damage is decent despite their low attack, and they're pretty squishy despite their high defense, so you really want to get them in and out as quickly as you can. Use groups of two to attack enemy ranged units from both sides and wipe them out before they can even get hit back on you. You can also use them to charge the backs of the front lines, but I'd only advise this if you run out of backlines targets, as they'll just take a lot more damage and they likely don't have the armor piercing to break through most melee infantry. Next up, we have the Feral Manticore. This works great alongside Harpies as part of the backlines hit squad with its very high, albeit non-armor piercing 
damage. It can deal massive area damage whilst the Harpies ensure nothing is left untouched to wipe out ranged infantry in moments. Again, you can go for the front lines if they run out of targets, but it does have Rampage, so watch out for it taking too much damage, otherwise you're going to lose it. Next up, the Charybdis. This is a great front lines anti-large monster that can honestly take on basically anything. It has massive attack stats and huge damage that's armor piercing, poison, and has a bonus versus large. Send it into the front lines to focus down anything it can proc that bonus on for a bit of added oomph. It'll do a ton of work without it, so anything extra will just be gravy. Add on the fact it lowers the leadership of all nearby enemies, and you've got an extremely tough and powerful monster on your hands. Next, the War Hydra. This has slightly worse stats than the Charybdis in melee, HP and weapon strength, but it does come with the Fire Breath, some added damage from a range. And on top of this, it also has some pretty insane regen, with passive regen as well as an ability that allows burst healing of 12% of max HP every 60 seconds with four uses. It may not deal as much damage in melee as the Charybdis, but if you use your abilities correctly, it can stick around for an excessively long time and cause a ton of damage in its extended lifespan. And finally, we have the Black Dragon. These guys are basically just the Lords on the Black Dragons, but with no Lord, meaning less HP and leadership. You can still use them basically the same to fly around the map, attacking basically anything you want with their high speed damage and melee stats. They have the same breath ability, so it can do some added damage from the skies as well as in melee. The only wrong way to use them is to not use them, so get them involved, avoid letting them get surrounded or focus fired, and this should do great. We also have one missile monster, the Blood Wreck Medusa. This is basically a fairly short range but very high damage artillery monster that can deal massive damage with its shots that hilariously have bonus versus infantry. If you can find a lord or hero on foot and she can hit them, they're going to be in a world of pain. That being said, just about anything you fire at will be in that same world, so pick whatever has the biggest single entity threat and watch their HP plummet. On top of the range, they're also pretty great in melon with good stats and high weapon strength, spelling a quick doom for anything that tries to get close to them. They're great all around monsters that excel in every department. I'd say use all my ammo first before sending them into melee to keep them healthy for as long as possible, whilst also getting plenty of value. And finally, we come to the artillery and war machines. First up, the Reaper Bolt Throwers. These are nearly identical to the Eagle Claws from the Hiles, but that doesn't mean that they're bad. They come with two fire modes, one for infantry and one for single targets. This allows them to switch fire modes depending on what target has the highest priority, meaning they'll do well versus basically anything. The only thing they don't do well in is melee, so keep them out of that at all costs, otherwise they're almost guaranteed to lose. Just keep them firing and you can't go too far wrong. And finally, we have the Blood Rack Shrine. This loses a lot of melee stats from the base monster, as well as losing plenty of armor piercing weapon damage, but gains armor and a little more ammo, as well as a couple of abilities. This changes it into more of a buff machine with powerful range damage than a jack of all trades, meaning keep it close to your units when firing, but avoid melee if you can, since it just doesn't have the damage to fight off anything that has a decent bit of armor. Add on the fact it's slower and has a large hitbox, and it's not really a great choice if you're wanting something that can do it all. Don't get me wrong, it is a great unit and the abilities are really good, you're just losing a lot of melee prowess to gain them. We also have Rakalf's monsters. These are only usable in his faction using the beast pen mechanic, and they're basically all stolen from other factions, so we're gonna go through these extremely quickly. The Explosive Squig, it's a squig that goes boom when it gets into melee, so it's great for blowing up groups of enemies. The Feral Cold Ones, they go on a rampage in seconds and are the worst unit in the Lizard Men, but are fast and do good damage, so decent against enemy range as long as they can't fight back. The Saber Tusk pack are literally the exact same unit as the Ogre Kingdoms, so nice fast warhounds with beefy damage. The Giant Spiders are the same unit that Drake can make use of in the Wood Elves, so kind of speedy, high damage spooky spiders. The Giant Wolves, again a Drake unit, so nice fast warhounds with decent damage. The Feral Bears, a Drake unit, not quite as fast but a lot more damage than Wolves, with a bonus versus large, making them great cav killers, or just some beefy front lines backup. The Feral Stegadon is the exact same as the Lizardmen unit, so it's a great front lines monster with just a touch of Rampage. The Feral Ice Bears are an improvement over the regular bears with more damage and attack at the cost of some HP and entities. The Feral Wyvern is the same unit the Greenskins can get in their Wars, so it's a high speed flying monster with armor piercing damage at Rampage. The Feral Mammoth is the same as the Norskin unit, so a great front lines monster with a large hitbox and Rampage. And the Feral Carnosaur is the same as the Lizardmen unit, so a great large target killer or front lines monster with a touch of Rampage. And now we come to the Regiments of Renown. First up, the Helbroni, they gain Expert Charge Defense. The Sisters of Singing Doom lose one melee attack and can now cause fear and terror. The Blades of the Blood Queen gain Frenzy and Guardian. The Bolt Fiends gain 20 range and Shield Breaker imbued missiles. Slanesh's Harvester swap their spells for Word of Pain and Soul Stealer. The Knights of the Ebon Claw gain Leadership and Melee stats, as well as Murderous Mastery. The Raven Heralds lose HP and gain Speed, Attack, Missile Strength and Flight. The Ravages of Rakaf lose Missile Strength and gain Poison Missiles and the Barbed Net ability. The Crows of Cain can now cause fear and have the Crow Feast ability. The Chill of Sontar swaps Fiery for Frost Breath and gains Frostbite attacks, and the Siren of Red Ruin loses one of each melee stat and gains the Whale of Malice ability. Finally, we come to the army compositions. First up, Tier 1, we're going to be starting with a Supreme Sorceress of Shadows. Going with one of these ladies since they are going to get great mounts later on, so we'll do well on the front lines and have that casting power, so end up being the best of both worlds eventually. Early on, you will struggle with the low damage output and general impact in battle, but get some levels into their spells and they'll quickly come online. 
We're a little bit limited, so we're going to have to go with 12 bleak swords. We're going to go with swords early. Realistically, you can get ranged units, but for some reason, not a tier 1 unit. So this is what we're going to have to do. We're going to go with the swords early on because basically we have no damage at this tier, so we need all the help we can get. It won't be as tanky as spears, but if you gang up on enemies and use your numbers advantage, the high damage will eventually overcome more powerful foes. And alongside them, we're going to use seven shielded dark riders. These are going to be the second part of that damage, being one of the few units at this tier. Cycle charge them into the backs of the front lines to break them as soon as possible and take out any ranged threats as soon as you can to remove their impact. Just keep them moving to keep them alive and do your best at this tier, to be honest, they're very limited. Coming to tier two, we should have amounts and spells on our caster and be a lot more impactful in battles, though still not quite at full power. We're going to pick up a Death Hag for their eventual buffing mount, but to start off with, there'll be kind of a weak frontlines hero with some decent abilities and impact later on down the line. The frontlines are upgrading to six Black Art Corsairs. These are the tankiest line we can get at this point, so they're the obvious choice. They'll come with some damage of their own, but will mostly rely on other units to do the majority and keep them alive. Speaking of which, Shades. These guys are going to be the primary damage dealer towards the front lines with their great range damage. Keep them safe as much as possible, but they'll be okay if they get caught out, as long as support comes quick. We're going to go with two Harpies and two Feral Man's Cores. These are going to work in pairs to take down enemy back lines using Blitz attacks. You want to get them in and out as fast as possible to prevent any rampaging and dismantle their lines before they get any value. And finally, closing us out, we have two Reaper Bolt Throwers. We're going to sit these guys at the back and fire on whatever is the biggest threat with their respective projectiles. Just keep them safe and they'll do great work. And finally, we come to tier 3. Our Sorceress should now be in a final form on that dragon with maxed out spells and be menacing in combat with spells, melee, abilities, everything. The Death Act should be on the Cauldron Mount for all those buffs, so be a great presence on the front lines, even if they aren't the most involved in heavy combat. The front lines finally upgrade into the Black Guard of Nagrond. These are super tanky and deal tons of damage to whatever they come up against. Still, we're going to give them as much support as possible to keep them alive and dealing that damage. Slight upgrade to the Great Sword Shades, mainly just keeping them safer if they get attacked. Still prioritize their range before sending them in, but if they get caught out, at least they'll give their attacker a licking before they start to flee. Now for the front lines monsters, we're going to go with two Charybdises. I toyed with the idea of one Hydra, but the Charybdis is just just a bit better. It's got better stats, a better ability, and the only thing missing is the regen, but if you wipe out enemies in seconds, you don't need to get any HP back. Send it into the front lines to have it prioritize anything large to get that bonus damage. If there are no suitable targets, then basically anything will do. As long as it's fighting, it's most likely doing well. We're going to go with two Bloodrite Shrines. These are going to spread themselves along your front line to provide auras through as many units as possible whilst dishing out as much range damage as they can. Avoid melee as much as you can, and they should do great. And finally, we're going to go with two Black Dragons. These are going to do basically whatever you need. Likely this will be attacking range since not much else in the army can do that, but once they're taken care of, pretty much anything is fair game with their insane damage. Use their breath abilities on cooldown and set wild. And that's how to play the Dark Elves in battle, but if you're looking for more faction rosters, then check out this playlist for all my Mortal Empires faction guides.